in announcement time, but I don't think we gave the uh, time for the ice cream social this afternoon at the Manor House, 3 o'clock. It's Sunday, Sunday. You build your own Sunday to your liking. And then we have a note in the bulletin, too, about Alex Best. If you want to use the GoFundMe uh, thing, you can make a donation to this roof repair in Kamaloo uh, through that, or you can send something directly to him. His address is there. Or you can see me if you want to make a contribution to the church that will be sent on to him. But you need to see me no later than today, and we'll put it in a fund and send it directly to Alice or to Alex at that address uh, that we gave you in the bulletin. Okay, I'm in a good mood, so it's going to be hard to talk about anger, but maybe I can work myself up to it. What, what do you think? Uh, probably I can. Uh, anger is one of the seven deadly sins, and uh, that goes back probably at least to the 6th century. There's a group of sins that were called deadly or fatal, you know, if you engaged in them, had dramatic bad effects on individuals. And anger was among those seven deadly sins. But point A of our outline says that anger can be a virtue as well as a vice, okay? If you notice in your bulletin inside at the very top of the page, of all the deadly sins, anger may be the most tricky to understand and deal with. While the others must be overcome, this one must be managed. That was uh, the key word that an individual used in a piece on anger, and I stole it from him. Uh, anger must be managed. It is potentially good, but usually it's bad when it's our anger rather than someone else's who is divine. Uh, this is something that must be managed. It's an aspect of our nature we must learn to express in a godly way. If we don't, then anger, like the other six vices, can be deadly. We all get angry, and usually we get angry when something is wrong, or at least it seems wrong to us. There's a sense of injustice that has occurred, and we're reacting to that. Now, our fallenness has skewed that just a little bit because what we deem to be in, in unjust or wrong may just be something that we are miffed at, and it's not really tied to uh, the larger issue of justice. But we're told in Scripture that Jesus got angry on occasion. And so we know it's not always deadly or it's always a vice. Jesus was angry when he drove out the money changers from the temple. And he said, you've made what was intended to be a house of prayer, a place of business where you're cheating people who can't afford to be cheated. On another occasion, this is very interesting, I think, where Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he was angry because of the hardness of their heart. He couldn't get through to them. He couldn't penetrate that shell they had put up there. And I think he still weeps when he wants to give us some good news, when he wants to help us, and we resist. Have you ever been in that situation yourself where you had some advice, at least you thought it was good advice, that would help someone, but they won't listen to you? And it's frustrating to the point of anger. And maybe you know this is the right way to go, this is the just or the positive way to go, but it's being resisted. And it's natural to be angry in that sort of uh, situation. God himself described himself as potentially angry. Exodus chapter 34, as he tells Moses who he is, he is the one who abounds in steadfast love, and he is slow to anger. Slow to anger. Yes, there's anger there, and it's connected with something that is wrong, something that is not right, and his anger is righteous. It, he wants to rectify what's wrong and make it right, and of course, when we resist, that anger may be intensified because 
he's out for our good and for our best interest. Now there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, that uh, puts it this way, that love is slow to anger. If you're a loving person, and God is love, and God is slow to anger, and if we are made in his image and we're like our God, that makes us slow to anger. Yes, we are angry at times, but we want to be lovingly angry, and that means we are slow to lose it uh, because we see something is wrong and we want to make it right. We'll probably talk some more about this next week, about how righteous anger or the good anger can lead to some uh, positive things that are happening. Um, it is possible to be good and angry. Ever heard that description? Well, yes, I'm angry. I'm good and angry. Uh, now, Jonah, he was the opposite of that. He was bad and angry. And God asked him, do you do well to be angry? He said, you bet I do. It happened just like I thought it was going to happen. That's why I ran away. I was afraid your compassion would come in and, you know, forgive these Ninevites, and they don't deserve to be forgiven. And I, I, wasn't I right? And uh, do you do well to be angry, John? Yes. Angry enough to die. That's when I would have said, Jonah, it's curtains. Uh, you're right. You are angry enough to die, and we're going to deal with that right now. Uh, Anger can become a vice. Proverbs chapter 14 says, Someone with a quick temper does foolish things, but someone with understanding remains calm. Now, which one of those best describes you? Someone with a quick temper, and you do something, you say something, and then later you think, maybe that wasn't the best. Maybe I should have listened a little bit longer and got the full context and the whole story. Proverbs warns us, if you're too quick on the trigger, uh, it can lead to problems. Proverbs 29, an angry person stirs up conflict, and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. I think that may be a reason why people who are quick-tempered or hot-tempered don't have really a lot of friends collected about them because you may be afraid you're going to get caught in the crossfire. Uh, an angry person stirs up conflict. A hot-tempered person commits many sins. The stirring up the conflict and the hot-tempered person here gets the other side over here going and it's back and forth and you're wondering where can I duck? and not get wounded here uh, in this uh, crossfire. Well, anger, when it's that sort, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that when it's the bad anger, notice uh, on, on the bottom of your outline there, Ephesians 4.31, get rid of all bitterness. And bitterness is a byproduct of anger. When you get angry and you nurse it and you keep it overnight and you won't let go of it, it turns into bitterness, a root of bitterness that can affect others, Hebrews tells us. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger. Get rid of it. Well, what about the good anger? Yeah, be angry for a while, channel it into a good purpose if that's possible. But don't let it stay there because you're flirting with danger if you keep it. So get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, the bad kind, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. The longer we keep anger, the more likely we are to have malicious thoughts and malicious actions. Okay. So anger can be a virtue or a vice, but what we're interested in is what James has to tell us here, that anger must be managed. And he gives us some suggestions here on how to manage our anger. If you'll notice the passage there in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, right at the, uh, the bottom of your outline there, 
I believe it's the first passage you have on, on yours. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, James said a lot there in just a very few verses. And you say, well, yeah, okay, that, that sounds like me. Uh, that's my description. Uh, number one, I try to manage my anger by being quick to listen. Point number one there. Anger must be managed, and yes, I am quick to listen. Is that you? Are you listening to me? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't get too personal on this. But I don't consider myself a good listener, and I really ought to be. And I'm trying to work on that. But listening is, uh, someone suggested, the first indication or the first sign of showing love. We love people and show love to them when we listen to them. Most of us want to listen or be listened to uh, rather than, uh, okay, uh, listen, 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 hurry it up, I got something to say. Um, take a look, I, I think it's this week's cartoons that I put up there. Uh, Baldo uh, has some uh, comic strips dealing with listening and uh, the point is being made that most people don't listen to understand, they listen to reply. Uh, I'm preaching to myself here, you know, a lot of times, uh, yeah, I'm kind of listening and I got the gist of what you said, but I can top that. Uh, I, you know, let me polish it off, let me put some frosting on your cake, let me uh, embellish here just a little bit and maybe even improve and tell you what you were trying to say, uh, listening with the intent of replying or countering what was just said, if I disagree with it, and maybe I don't get the whole story. James says we need to be quick to listen, patiently listen. Proverbs again, chapter 18, he who listens before, he who answers before listening, that is, his folly and his shame, Proverbs 18, verse 13. If you answer before you've listened fully, completely, it's a foolish thing and you're gonna be embarrassed somewhere down the line. Well, how do you listen? Do you listen to understand or to reply? Good listeners, I've noticed, some people, you know, they, they bring us in. We can tell they like us, we can tell uh, loving actions just by the way they listen and they give us the floor and we like the floor and we like to talk and we like to express our feelings and we like to think out loud and a good listener is just complimenting us and embracing us by that listening quality. I'm working on it. I'm trying to become uh, a better listener. Good listeners listen between the lines. Good listeners pick up on moods and attitudes and good listeners hear what isn't said. You ever notice that? Sometimes when I'm talking to a good listener and uh, we're saying, making comments here about what was said and what they plan to do, and then the good listener says, did you notice the person didn't bring up this or didn't say anything about that? You're right. I hadn't thought of that. Listening includes not only hearing what is said, it's hearing what isn't said, and it's picking up on the mood and the attitude that brought it out. Where are they emotionally? Where are they struggling and so forth? So James says, be quick to listen. That's our main task, to make sure we're listening, make sure we're loving people by the way we listen to them. Number two, be slow to speak. It's getting a little tougher, isn't it? 
okay, I can maybe be a slow listener and they won't notice. But if I'm a quick speaker, they will. Be quick to listen, be slow to speak. Pro Proverbs chapter 29, verse 20 says, a fool speaks in haste. Proverbs 17 tells us that the wise individual has few words. Let me get these on the screen for us here. Do you see someone who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Do we believe that? There's more hope for a fool than someone who is trigger happy with his comment. The next one from Proverbs, a truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even tempered. Cool, few words. Okay, you're saying get on with the sermon. Got your point. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth so let your words be few. Everything, you know, we get nervous when we recognize that technology has led us into some realms where everything is recorded, everything there's a record of here and there, and, and boy, you know, we, we wonder, what did I say on Facebook that might be out there forever? Um, God's recorder knows everything, records everything. Thankfully, he's gracious to forgive us. But what Solomon is trying to tell us here is slow down. God is in heaven. He's in charge. You're on earth. Let your words be few. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 tells us that don't be quick to make a vow. You keep a vow, God expects you to if you make one, he expects you to keep it. So don't be quick with your words to make a vow, to make a promise, and then fall away. God, who is faithful, wants us to be faithful. Be slow to speak. Let your words be few. And then finally here, point number three. Anger must be managed by this quality of humility. We need to be humble. If you'll look on your bulletin again, on the back, another quote from Brian Wilkerson. You see, anger is always about control. I think this is a crucial comment that he makes here. Anger is about control. When we get angry, we're trying to control somebody or some situation. If I yell loud enough, if I speak harshly enough, if I sulk long enough, if I strike hard enough, I can fix things. I can make people do what I want them to do. I was reading someone else, he says, sometimes we show our anger by being either a, a, a rhino or a porcupine. A rhino, we just charges and goes right over whatever he or she doesn't like. I'm going to control you, but I'm just running right over you and just full speed ahead. Porcupines curl up, and they kind of go off to themselves. And you try to get close to them, you're going to get poked, and it's going to hurt. That's the way porcupines express their anger. So whether you or one you live with is a rhino that charges, or a porcupine that retreats, you're still about to get hurt by someone who's angry. Uh, if I sulk long enough, you know, I can express anger that way. Strike hard enough, I can fix things. I can make people do what I want them to do. Anger gives us the illusion of control. The irony, of course, is that when we do that, we end up losing control rather than gaining it. We make things worse instead of better. Anger needs to be countered with this quality of humility. 
And that's part of the way James expresses it here. Uh, we need to have humility in order to be a good listener, to value what someone else says rather than just what we think. And sometimes when we think we know better or been there, heard that, it takes humility to give someone else the floor, to give someone else a hearing and listen to them. We're not too quick to do that. And so we're rapid to speak rather than slow to speak. Humility will counter this. It's necessary to hear and to receive what someone else is saying and even the scripture. Look again at that passage uh, from James. After saying human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires, therefore get rid of all of this, this moral filth, the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. I think that's very important. If we are angry people, if we're not humble people, we will not hear God's word. We will not receive it. It will not be planted in us to where it can grow and be productive and fruitful. So James is saying, yes, be quick to listen, be slow to speak, but put this together with humility that makes you a good listener, that makes you receptive, because if you're not, then you will resist even God's word. You have to be humble before it can get into your heart. Because, you know, how many times do we say, well, I've heard that. I remember one time talking to a, a, a class that was new to me, and I said, how about a study of the book of Acts, you know? Uh, we've been there, we've read that. As if there's nothing new, you know, once we've read it. Um, they weren't angry, but they weren't humble either. Uh, humility makes us open and receptive to what God's word has to say to us. And sometimes the correction will be hard for us to take. Sometimes we will not want to follow in that path because we deem it too difficult. Sometimes we will resist it because it's not all my fault. You ought to see what this person did. You ought to hear what she said. Humility is what caps it off. We'll talk more about anger and uh, how to deal with it, how to manage it, and how uh, we can do something productive with it uh, in the next week's lesson as well. If you'd like to respond today and pray honestly, um, prayer is one of the ways we, we deal with anger. Maybe we were angry at ourselves and maybe we don't have the humility to admit it. Maybe we're angry at someone else and we don't pray for them or pray for ourselves because of our anger. But when you read the Psalms, as we've been doing on Wednesday night, that's one of the ways they attacked anger. They prayed their anger. They were honest with God. God knows what's there anyway, and they let it out so it could be healing to them. God didn't need to hear it, but they needed to hear themselves. If you need a prayer request, if you need to draw closer to God, uh, now's a good time. Would you do that while we stand and sing?